Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Our guest today, Mickey Robinson, was an accomplished athlete, but thought he'd found the best high ever when, at 19 years old, he learned to skydive. He thought the number one motivation in life is pleasure and a minute's worth of free fall topped the list. He was ready to go professional after only 20 jumps, but his life changed forever when the new plane they were flying in stalled after too steep a takeoff, lost all lift, and plunged straight down at 100 miles an hour. When they hit, things only got worse. As the plane cartwheeled, fell apart, and burst into flames, covering Mickey's broken body and burns. But miraculous healings came from his spiritual encounter during Mickey's near death experience. And the more than five years of Mickey's healing and rehab has been followed by a fulfilling long term life change as Mickey has dedicated his life to working for God. His book, Falling into Heaven, tells the story of being restored to life with a message to bring to others. Mickey Robinson, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee, and it's good to be here with you. Well, it's great to have you, and it's an amazing story. Mickey, I outlined the story of your skydiving and the plane crash, but please give our listeners the details of that adventure and tell them about your friend, the hero who risked his life to save you. Well, at that point in my life, skydiving had been priority was way number one. Everything else was either on the back burner, I can get to it later. And when you are obsessed with something, especially something you're good at and you enjoy, you don't have to work yourself up. You're always in a state where I want to do it next. And that's how I was. So uh, it was a Thursday night. I came home from work. I stripped down my clothes. My parachute was ready to throw in the car and drive out to uh, the new field that we actually started our own club by then in a suburb of Cleveland called Brunswick, Ohio. And for me to get in an airplane took about as much courage or motivation as to get in a car and drive to somewhere I liked. I mean, it was no big, I I started flying airplanes. I have mentioned this other times, but when I found out it was so much more fun jumping out of them, uh, I I didn't think about flying anymore. And any pilot will say, why would you jump out of a perfectly good flying airplane? Every single pilot you ever talked to would say that. (laughs) For those people that found pleasure in, in the skydiving uh, sport, which was that time was called the space age sport. And uh, as a kid, I was always interested in aviation, whether it was the Wright brothers, NASA, birds, rockets, you name it. And so this became some of some of my kind of heart's desire. I became a skydiver and going out there. um, We uh, started this club and we were jumping professionally like show jumps on occasion where someone want to have aerial entertainment and it was a political thing or a big church carnival or something like 10, 15,000 people. And we would jump in and free fall and land on a target and everybody, yeah, that's wonderful. And, uh, <laughs> and they give us a little bit of money and, and free food, hot dogs and beer, whatever. And, you know, you felt pretty good, but this particular night we were, uh, there were three of us who were professional skydivers. We were putting out two students. So there was five skydivers and in a plane, a Piper Cherokee six, which is two seats, two seats and two seats. We'd pull five of the six seats out. So we had more room or equipment and all that. And so we had done this enough in this type of airplane. It was second nature to me. And by then flying was a little boring. We had to put one student 2,800 feet. It was going to take several, you know, a a bit of time, another student at 4,000 feet. So I'm just going to doze off and go to sleep, uh, you know, and just, and there was a piece that would come on me when the plane would take off because I just knew I was going to do something I really liked, which is kind of happens to people. But shortly after takeoff, uh, I was awakened by uh, a horrible sound, silence. The engine quit and the pilot hit me. I'm I'm sitting on the floor next to him without a seat or a seatbelt. He said, oh, my God, that's it. We're going down. And an aerodynamic stall at that altitude, it was 100 feet or less. Going Probably once uh, we lost lift and the airplane was coming down, probably going 100 miles an hour. People say, well, why didn't it? Why didn't you start the, too late to start the motor? Uh, if you have a stall, you put the nose down, you get a little airspeed and you glide mm-hmm. up. Well, there's, there's no time for that. So it couldn't jump out. So, and I'm sure the view out the windshield, although I don't remember it. I, the last thing I remember is the pilot saying that to me and say, oh my God, that's it. We're going down. And I'm sure the view out the windshield, everybody thought we're going to die. 
So we hit a tree, like you explained, an airplane cartwheel on its wings. Fortunately, we wedged in the ground right side up. But on impact with that tree, my face stopped my body, no seatbelt. And I didn't have my helmet on, which I was supposed to put on right away. It was a mistake, but that's what happened. So my face stopped my body going 100 miles an hour. So I sustained a really bad head injury. What I remember, what happened was there was confusion and the students were, there was minor injuries, but it looked pretty bad because their heads smashed into each other when the impact and they helped them out. They ran out. And the last guy out was my partner who was the closest one to the open baggage door, which we'd removed. And as he got out and, and was took a few steps away, the plane exploded and he heard screaming as a, uh, and uh, in a, this type of aircraft, it was a low wing Pepper Cherokee 6. There's rubber bladders that hold the fuel. And the one in, we had drained the one on the left side of the plane for weight purposes, make the plane lighter. Mm. So the one over here was full of fuel. It tore open and splashed all over the inside of the cockpit and all over me. And Dan heard the screaming and went inside the plane. I was soaked with fuel and burning on fire from head to toe. Now I had on my parachute, I had on a jumpsuit, but it was soaked with aviation fluid. And, and the very thing that was taking me up for pleasure had become my funeral by So I was burning alive. The pilot trapped in his seat, his legs underneath the instrument panel was stuck. And uh, Dan pulled so hard, these, uh, something had me caught. And I, I was trying to get out when I was pulling with this hand, trying to get out this torn open fuselage, here, but I was stuck, horrible. And um, he pulled so hard, he tore the straps, loose, dragged me away and, and then rolled, they rolled me on the ground to get the fire out. And uh, he told me some of this. I, was not, I vaguely remember like waving my arms and, you know, and stopping the fire. Like it's kind of cloudy, mysterious, like, and cause stuff was melting and sinking into me, you know, plastic and metal. And, um, and then I, then they on the ground, I said to him, well, how bad is he? he said, I can't tell a lot of smoke, but he said, you know, he, he thought I was going to die. And I'm an athlete, professional in perfect health, but it was horrible. And I got up and he said, go. And so I got up and I took about 10 steps because they thought the, the right wing was going to blow up. Mm. And uh, I fell over backwards and uh, my head hit the back of the ground. I put my hand and, and the, the back part of my head was stuck to the palm of my hand. And then I, I just went, I just went out. And um, so I don't remember the actual crash mm. for whatever reasons that is. Um, and I don't remember too much. I don't remember very much of being burning alive, but I do remember those things. And these things were told to me very accurately. And on the way to the hospital for the first time in my life, a person that heard all about God, the God of the Bible, the God, the father, Jesus Christ, our Lord, from the time I'm an infant, everything else, including parochial school, but I never really knew him. And as, to my knowledge, I had no ever crying out to God for help or acknowledgement, never heard anybody talk about a real personal relationship with the Lord. But now a guy that thought he was bulletproof at 19 years old, had his act together. I realized I, was, I didn't realize how bad I was hurt, but I knew this was really bad. And on the way in the MS for the first time in my life, I cried out. I said, God, please help me. Please help me. Please help me. That's the most common prayer that ever busts through the floor of heaven and before the presence of God <laughs> in any language is help. And I remember that the sign of the whine of that ambulance. And to this day, when I either see flashing lights or an ambulance, I just stick up my hand and say, take care of them. People driving it over there taking care of, because I know it's a crisis and an emergency. So I get to the hospital anyway. Uh, so the injuries, and you want me to talk about the injuries I sustained? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I had a brain injury from hitting my head. I was burned massively over a terrible, large portion of my body, third degree burns in uh, probably 35 to 40 percent second degree burns over another large area my right eye was blind and my eyelids were burned in, in back the whole side of my body my sister said looked like a, a blackened hot dog on a grill the whole some part of my face and part of my body the burns were terrible obviously and and though i was in that kind of condition of health they didn't think i'd, I'd make it through the light uh, through the night they thought i would I'd just go into shock and die subsequently what happened after, which is worse, are the complications that can ensue. And although they tried all the heroics of, uh, you know, antibiotics and bandages and prevention, I got all the horrible things. I got infection over all over my entire body. I was, uh, like I said, blind in this eye. I had began and had massive weight loss. In the evaporation process alone of these kind of burns, hmm. it burns six or 7,000 calories per liter of water. So the kind of burns I had would be like six or seven liters. So that's 40,000 calories a day wow. being used just in the, just in the process. And so, and like, I wasn't, you know, I, 
I was, you know, I was 175 pounds. And in a very short period of time, I went down to 92 pounds. I developed the cubitus ulcers. Those are bed sores that there were holes in my body that bones were sticking through in my heels on my side. I had tubes in, in my chest, uh, drainage tubes. I wasn't on any kind of ventilator, but I was on oxygen. And I had seven complications that were so bad is it's hard to believe when you read about them or when the doctor tells you about them. And as I got worse and worse and worse, uh, the doctors told my family, well, it's just a matter of time. My mom says, is he out of the woods yet? And I said, Mrs. Robinson, your son is not coming out of the woods, even though they were trying everything. And it was just a matter of time. They brought in a specialist from a famous hospital in Cleveland, Case Western Reserve, some people that know about that. And he examined me and he just said, uh, I, I, the only notes I have are, are, the, are those uh, discharge notes. He said, it said, uh, just keep doing what you're doing with the pain medicine and antibiotics. He says, there's nothing I can offer this young man. In other words, scientifically and medically, there was no hope from any of the people trying as hard as they could. And God bless them for whatever they did. It was that point when I was worse that this, what we call now a near-death experience occurred, which I had never heard of near-death experiences. I never heard of any kind of mystical things like that. And I remember vividly, very, sometimes, you know, I was out in a coma from either the brain damage or, uh, or um, whatever, which was a blessing part of the time when you're unconscious, your body may be experiencing pain, but you're not very aware of it. And sometimes it's kind of in there. And sometimes I'm awake and I'm super conscious. And there is no pain medicine that can take away this kind of pain. And that prayer, that little desperate prayer in the ambulance, I prayed on the operating table when they're taking me in, in the, in the ICU, when they give you pain medicine doesn't help. But now there's no hope. Now this is kind of this is kind of interesting, and I don't always talk about this just because there's a lot of stuff to talk about, but I was laying there in a coma on this particular time. It was a couple of weeks after all of this started, and you could have poked me with a surgical knife. You could have electrocuted, and I wouldn't have known. I couldn't hear. I couldn't see. Yet I could see the doctor over the guardrails holding my chart and talking to a nurse and said, when this patient, Mr. Robinson, dies, I want you to sanitize this entire area and move that, uh, Mr. Clark into this place. And I'm, I'm saying, no, no, don't, don't do, don't talk like that. So my spirit somehow could hear and see this doc. I could tell you what he was wearing. I can tell you what this nurse looked like, but I was helpless to do anything. So if I tell people, if you're in the hospital and you're talking to a person and they tell you where they can't hear you, they, they might be able to hear you and you might be able to say and encourage them and they could re internally respond. So then the next day, you know, I was having a fever Something this on this particular day, the next day after that, my fever was like 105 going to 106. And they couldn't do ice packs or alcohol because my body was raw. So they had a vinyl sh sheet, like underneath the sheet, circulating cold fluid. So I'm burning up with a fever and freezing at the same time and in pain so bad. And my respiration was real rapid kind of respiration. So they had the, the back of the bed tilted up and I was just and I could feel something weird happening. It's like life was leaking out of me. It's like if I had a switchboard, uh, like you have in your garage, it's like the switches, I just feel just like something just changing, leaking out. It was different. This particular day was different than any other day. It was at that point where I had what I now know is a near-death experience. My spirit came right out of my body, and instantly I was in a dimension. I wasn't on the earth above the hospital or looking down at my body. I was in a dimension spiritually, and it was instant. And I was totally aware of things I never knew about. In other words, I had an ability to understand and comprehend and feel eternity. As long as we're here, we're always aware of uh, space and time and beginning and end, young and old, born and die. You know, we're, we're just in the realm here, no matter how spiritual we are, how much, whatever, as long as we're here, we're in that context. But in this spirit realm, you're totally aware of eternity. And it, it seems hard, you know, people try and, Use examples. If a bird flies by the Rock of Gibraltar once every thousand years, when it gets down to a grain of sand, uh, that's one day of eternity. Well, that's still finite. It's so real when you experience eternity, it it defies all of those attempts. And um, um, at any rate, um, that was the first thing. And then I was seeing things. They're so different. Like there was colors, and they were just more colorful than anything you've seen on Earth. And I was like gliding. My spirit man was gliding. See. I realize now that I am a spirit. We have a soul and my body was somewhere back laying in that hospital bed. And uh, I was like gliding on an upward path and I could see in the distance, a white circular thing. It was bright white, uh, very, but I could look right at it and it was whiter than snow. And I, you live in the 
you live in the north too. I remember it was sometimes snow so white you had sunglasses, and he had to, I could look at it and it was very peaceful. And as I was traveling there, everything was so unreal. I mean, so it was more real than this that we're talking, but it was so unreal that everything is stunning. I, I was flabbergasted, just in awe of this. And there was no control over what was, I couldn't change things, go back, make a decision. I was just in this dimension. And as I got closer to this white opening, only my way to describe it, I felt like a pressure or something on my right side. And I looked and I looked into something that was blacker than black. Simultaneously, I understood it's eternal. It is, is a bottomless abyss where there's no end to it. It is like a giant vortex of nothingness that if a person would go in there, they'd be super con conscious. They would never experience anything, never see anybody, never taste anything, never be enlightened. But you would have a total remorse for all those things being missing and being cut off from the source of all life. And I could feel that closing. This blackness was, was like I was like sinking in it and it was closing this white light. So I cried out. Now I'm on what I describe as the precipice of eternity, the edge of eternity. And I cried out the same desperate and hopeless cry. God, help me. I'm sorry. Please. I want to live. I want to be alive. Give me. I said, give me another chance. I want to be alive. And when I said that. My spirit man was thrust through this wide opening and I was standing in what I know now to be the presence of God in the third heaven. And now the, it, the, the blackness that you that you witnessed, uh, which I guess is something we would call hell. But but you see it as isolation, as a being cut off from other people or other spirits of of any sort. Is that, cut off is that from the source of life from God himself, the, the hor most horrible thing, the source of all life is God and God's creation and God's, God's realm. This is separated from that. I, I firmly believe it was the outer darkness. It says there'd be weeping and gnashing of teeth because you realize what you gave up for not receiving what was available to you. And uh, because you don't have that as an explanation, but the knowledge of being separated was so vivid. And so I, I tasted, if I could put it that way, what it would be like and then with that cry, somehow the mercy of God, I'm standing in the third heaven. And the same thing was true, aware of eternity. But this time, this incredible beauty of God, the light of God, the revelation of redemption was going to he's going to take care of me forever. the opposite. It was going to be taken care of forever. I was going to be it would be more fulfilling than anything you can imagine. And, and they say, well, what is it like? Well, if I can just I'll, I'll describe that because you want me you ask me that. But yes. again, it, it was flabbergasting in the same sense, but so inspiring. One of the things I, I'll mention three things. I mentioned this and there's other things I can describe. The first thing was eternity. It is mind blowing. I mean, it is like it's altering and put it that way. Your whole life becomes altered when you comprehend in, in a dissociated way of the physical world eternity. The second thing that it, it was all simultaneous that I was aware of and this consciousness I had, it's as if I had never done anything wrong and I never experienced anything bad. It was wiped away. I, I, how do you explain that? Because even though we're forgiven here and we're walking in grace, we're walking in the love of God, we have a memory. And we have certain things that go on. That's all gone. You won't have remorse of what you didn't do, who you didn't invite, what didn't happen. You won't have any of that. I don't think you'll even have memory of muscle memory of being scared of something. I think you're going to be just free of all those things that are here. When it talks about, you know, you know, when it talks about the kind of joy, unspeakable and full of glory, that's it. And I tasted that. And the third thing, which is, I think, the most powerful and again, I didn't see God. I didn't see any individuals. I didn't see any cute little fat babies with pampers on playing guitars and seeing any of that. And, uh, and, but the presence of God was somewhere over here. I sensed like on my left and going through me was this glittering stream of light between I'm standing and between where my waist and my knees, which is the river of life. And when that river, goes, when everything that touches that river becomes more alive, than anything we can imagine being alive is about. And it's from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it talks about the river of life. And um, so I didn't see the presence of God, but I could feel his presence in all these different ways. And the most powerful thing is the undiluted, perfect love of God, not filtered through even a forgiven experience here or through the grace that it, it takes to stand in the Lord in a broken world and with still an incomplete life. This is the pure love of God which is absolutely 
shattering. Now you'd say heaven, I didn't, you know, I didn't see people, I didn't see objects, but I could see whatever heaven was made out of looked like translucent glass that you could see through, but it had like colors in it that you could perceive too, all kinds of colors. And it's all around and everything that was in heaven. And I was the only person that I could see then was alive and everything worships God, <laughs> not because <laughs> you're scared or you have to, because you can't, because we were made to worship. And if we deny our worship on the earth, we're denying our existence as a person. We'll worship something. For me, whether it was worship or not, I idolized skydiving and my abilities to be an expression. For whatever reasons, it brought me pleasure. For a moment, I was li literally living for the moment. A lot of people live for a moment, and it could be 70 or 80 years. It could be a good career. It could be a relationship. It could be you could have invented something. It could be money. It could have been something, all these different things. But all of those things are temporal, as good as they could be. But this, this existence uh, and in God, and so you don't have to try. It's the greatest joy to be in the presence of God. Yeah. Now, you call this the third heaven. What do you mean by that? Well, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens. That's obviously plural. I think it's limited to three. What we can look up in the heavens is the sky, the clouds, and even the stars. That would include all that. The created visible universe and those things. Paul, the apostle, talks about the third heaven. He says, I know a man, I know a man 14 years ago that was caught up in the third heaven. He was talking about himself, but he was uh, talking That's about it, his own near-death experience. His own near-death experience. Oh. I, I think it was when he was stoned, whether he was dead or alive, they thought he was dead and they made a circle and prayed for him. He could have been, well, whatever. I think it was near-death experience because he became alive. He was still alive. Yeah. And so there obviously is a second heaven. The second heaven is a place where I think the thrones and the principalities and powers, certain fallen angels, demons, as well as God's angels interact there. And I, it could extend all the way down to the earth in an invisible sense. I don't know. All I know is when I was out of my body, I was there. I was totally unaware of anything physical or anything earthly in that realm. So there's a spiritual dimension. Now, you know, there's other religions. And I know that you, you looked into certain things where there's soul travel and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And they can they have out of the body experiences and go places like that. I don't I recommend not trying any of that on your own because <laughs> there's a lot of weird things that can happen. But I think there's a lot of second heaven experiences. As a matter of fact, they talk about a waterless place. And if you empty yourself out, something else might come in. But the opposite is that true. When, when the scripture tells us to meditate in the Lord, the difference between that and certain other uh, esoteric thought is you get full of the word and full of the experience of God and full of the love of God. It's it's more of an infilling of meditation rather than um, exert, uh, emptying yourself out. Mm. So, but this fullness of God in heaven. So the second heaven, I mean, your, your mind is, is super conscious. And that, when I say super conscious, I mean that fully conscious. And it's not iffy. It's not, well, are you sure it wasn't drugs? Well, while standing there, you're going to say, how long did it last? You're not in a time realm. So it doesn't really matter. It's not really, it might as well could have been a million years and it wouldn't have made any difference. Mm. Then what opened in front of me was an open vision showing about six and a quarter years of the future. Let me ask you before we leave the second heaven, we were raised Catholic, you and I, and there's this notion of purgatory in Catholicism. Do you see any relation between the second heaven and purgatory? No, I'm not sure. And though I've, I've, I've looked into it, I, my perception or my, my guessing is that purgatory be a place of encouragement of people that, you know, nobody get, is lost. And so you can go to a place and you can use indulgences to get out of there and basically get elevated into heaven. I don't see that. The scripture says when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. So there'd be an initial type of a judgment. Mm -hmm. And of course, somewhere in the future, there's a great white throne of judgment when at the end of the age and all that, es that different type of end times eschatology. Um, I say this concerning purgatory. The second heaven is a very a very real realm where there's spiritual things that go on that uh, occur. People have seen angels and, and I can get into that. I've seen angels here on earth. Uh, some as humans, some in the, my room and all that. I don't focus. Paul says, we'll talk about dreams and visions. Well, I do that on a rare occasion. I, I want to focus more on life on earth with the power of God's love to bring change and transformation. So all of that to say the second heaven encounter was real. But that's not the calling that we have. And one of the things and I said, and I, I mentioned this to you, and again, I'd have to check now, maybe it's more. At one time, I knew that there was about 250,000 people in the United States that reported or, or said they had a near-death experience. 
Uh, and there's been certain people out of, uh, I think as Ernest Hemingway was grazed by a bullet in World War I, and his spirit, he didn't have a near-earth experience, but his spirit came out of his body. He said it was like taking a handkerchief out of your pocket, just swirled around and went back in. So there are people who have had somewhat of those mystical things. But mine includes the awareness of God, the need for God's forgiveness and love, and then receiving, uh, seeing the, the terror and the real ultimate hope. Now, a lot of people said, they say they're hopeless. Well, as long as you can say you're hopeless, then there still is hope. But I saw, you know, I was both medically hopeless, and then I saw eternal hopelessness. That's real to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk about, if I was talking about somebody that questioned all of this, I'd say, well, there's all, what are the possibilities? There's two. There is an afterlife or oblivion. This is it. We're the highest created being in the food chain. And once you're dead, you're dead. You just vanish into nothingness. And that's it. You were here and you're gone. If that's the case, you might as well party. You know, Paul says, <laughs> if there's no resurrection, we're of all people to be most pitied. But also with, the, with that afterlife, where is your afterlife going to be? And that's the hope that I have to share. I tasted, I saw it, and then I was sent back to testify about it. That Golden River, which is such a, an amazing image, do you see any relationship between that and the Holy Spirit? Well, it's hard to separate the Holy Spirit from, we know that the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside us, and that the Lord himself is inside us. The, uh, the, the presence of God in the beginning first hovered over the waters, and, and then it was in the tabernacle with Moses, and then it was in the tabernacle of David, and then we realized that it was in one person for three and a half years on the ground, <laughs> Jesus Christ. But now it's been given for all of us um, when we are uh, receive him as Lord. We're born again. He comes and lives inside of us. And there's so much more activity of the Holy Spirit that we can be aware of. And I think that because of a lack of familiarity and maybe a misunderstanding, we might miss out on some of the advantages of God, the Holy Spirit in our life. Some people encounter the Lord and their their reception of the gospel and understanding of of God so loved this world, he sent his only begotten son, thinks that they're going to, when they die, they get to go to heaven, and that's a goal. Well, it's a very important part, obviously. But, and I, I mentioned this before, you know, people want to talk about life after death. Well, what about life before death? Because I've been here for 54 years. If I knew what I was before, be, uh, here's the big thing. I knew what I was before, and I saw where eventually I'm going to go, but what about while I'm here? So it's the activity of the love of God through the, through the activity of the Holy Spirit and what God has provided for us in our transforming process, that uh, we don't stay the same. We, be, we, sh we should be more conformed to the image of Jesus. And so that's it. In terms of that river and the Holy Spirit, we know that the river is, Jesus said in John 7, 37, on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, where they celebrate all this thing about water. They have a big celebration when you got water out of the rock. He stands up and says, if anyone's thirsty, let them come into me and drink. And out of the midst of you, Will flow, will flow rivers of living water. So to answer your question, yes, that river is inside me now, and it's plural. And sometimes that river could, could speak hope and encouragement to somebody who doesn't know any of this. That river might be uh, 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 an access for them to get healing. That, that might be to remove something that haunted them or plagued them all their life in the area of fear or shame. You know, sometimes the activity of the Holy Spirit is specific for certain people at certain times. I mean, I'm going through things right now where I want I want to be better in the Lord than I ever was. I can't say I was there and God did all this. That's what God did. How am I going to conform to that? And still, I'm just as desperate as I was. I don't you mentioned this yesterday in our little talk. I said, I don't want to think of myself as an expert. X means has been and spurt is a drip under pressure. So now I'm a learner and a follower with lots of other people. And and though I've had a vast amount of experiences, there's so much more to learn about the Lord and how you walk with him and how you interact with other people here on earth. Uh, one of the things that I can say this, uh, that I've enjoyed is how relatable my near-death experience is to all kinds of people. doesn't matter about their education. doesn't matter about their uh, financial status. doesn't matter about their ethnic background. It doesn't matter about, uh, about their age or their IQ. They're in wonder, wanting to know about it. And to me, I think that's a blessing. As hard as it was uh, to go through, uh, the, the, value, the value of it is indescribable. People need something that's real. And when they look at me, they know I'm probably not kidding, at least about a lot of this. Mm. And the fact that I was blind for five and a half years and I can now see. And the doctors 
don't have any explanation to that. There are actually a lot of miracles in, in your healing. I want to get to that. But I want to also ask you about when you pass by that empty void, I know you said you wouldn't wish anyone that fate, even an Adolf Hitler or a Bin Laden. And at the same time, when you entered the third heaven, your sins were so completely forgiven that you didn't even have to go through a life review as such. It was just taken away from. It's like they didn't exist anymore. Yeah. The scripture says we are hidden with Jesus in the cross. You know, that part is it. So that part. So people say, would you have become a believer if you didn't get that accident? Well, that's, you know, that's a question that can't be answered. I wasn't headed in that direction. And what would have happened if I didn't return to the earth? Well, my life would have extended that the only kind of repentance or relationship I had was a couple of weeks. So I wouldn't have achieved anything redemptively in the Lord. And when he talks about works, a man lives by faith and not by works, it's talking about putting your confidence in the works of rules, the works of the law. But there are the righteous acts of the saints. We're supposed to live for the Lord, and there's going to be a reward. And I believe that there's a reward. There's rewards here, and there's a reward in heaven. I probably have a much bigger account in heaven than I do here. Either way, to be alive again, and I mentioned this to you before, when you lose something, like I was my legs were paralyzed. I said, I'd never walk again. And you get something back that you lost. When you're blind for five and a half years and you can see again, you really appreciate it more. When you lose love that you thought you, someone you're going to spend the rest of your life and you have love again, it's more powerful. How much more is it when you have lost your life, the gift of life, and you get it back and you get it back with a purpose? And that's been the thing. There was a there was those periods of time when I was uh, going through a lot of uh, physical healing and being operated on for years. Um, I, I, I knew what I was saved from and I know what I was saved to, but what was I saved for? And one of the biggest things that we've been able to do, my wife and I and our ministry is help people find out their purpose and des- destiny. It doesn't matter if they're called to a full-time career. That's fabulous. But everybody has some type of a spiritual, I call it a prophetic destiny, a God spoken destiny. And to give people some identification and give them a gentle push forward is one of the most rewarding things. Because I have a person that lost everything and I got all this back. Different. You've mentioned that when you were there, it was like, I think you said, a 3D hologram. But there was also, it sounds like there was a dialogue between you and was it the river? Was it God himself? There was more of a revelation rather than the person speaking. So I saw things on the earth and some of it, I was like an observer watching and some of it, I was drawn right into the matrix of this vision I was seeing. Like I saw my wife five years before we met. I saw her in this heavenly vision. I I could feel I was, there was a rusty gate. My arm was on it. I could feel the sunlight. I could smell these flowers growing there. And I looked, I saw this pretty young woman walk towards me and I felt peace. Well, that's a farm we bought in Ohio that didn't happen for almost five years later. And then I saw this group of people and I could hear them talking on top of this hill, the tropical place. And I got zoomed in. Like I said, I got drawn into the matrix of it and it was me speaking. And I said, this is paradise. This is like paradise. There was a piece of property in on the island of Jamaica in the Caribbean that I had gotten a little bit of money and was considering buying it. And then the Spirit of the Lord came to me and said, and then that's when the vision ended. And then I was in the presence of God, and I knew I was coming back here. But when it actually happened in 1973, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, there is no paradise on earth. There's the kingdom of God. And so I canceled the whole idea of buying that and went back to Ohio. I said, Barbara, we can't do this. God got something else for us. We bought our little farm. And, And then eventually the Lord called me into the ministry. So I just wanted to go there and be nice, be the nicest person in the world. I don't want any more trouble with politics and this and the other thing. You know, it was, I was disillusioned with uh, what happened in the 60s and the 70s in terms of fighting over, over various things. And I was full of a peace. And I knew where it came from, but I didn't know that God had more for me in this peace than just to keep it for myself. It wasn't for me just to sit there and eat bananas or pull people up and down the beach behind a parasail, be the nicest guy in the world. It had a purpose for me, and that was to impact people's lives with the hope and the love of God. Yeah. So that, that vision, so it was the only thing the Lord spoke is when the vision ended, he spoke to me, not like you and I are talking, it's been recorded here, but the, the supernatural word of God came into me that I was going back to the earth. And I had this like, oh, no, and you, you can't change it and argue. But in reality, he was answering my cry. 
I'm sorry, give me another chance. And so my spirit came out of the third heaven, I'm assuming you passed through the second heaven, I don't remember that. I could feel my spirit actually going through the ceiling of the hospital and sinking into my body. Like if you can think allegorically, if you can imagine, if you felt like wind, it went through a real thick, spongy tree. You could actually feel that. And as it sank in, I could see out of this eye, because this one was blind. I could hear out of my ears. I'm laying flat on my back, looking up at the ceiling. And I heard myself worshiping God in a way I never heard of. And the person who was dead was now alive. And all of a sudden, go ahead. Go I was ahead. going to say, you had also mentioned, um, I guess, while was this while you were still in the third heaven? Uh, speaking um, a beautiful language that you didn't recognize at all. That happened when I returned in my body in the hospital. Ah, okay. And I'd never heard of that before. So I could hear out of my natural ears. I was looking, I mean, I remember waking, it's, it's, it's the only way I can describe it. It's like when they beam up on Star Trek, if you've ever seen movies and all that. You know, the oh, movie yes. just materialized. And all of a sudden I'm laying in this bed and I could hear this. And as soon as I thought, what is that all about? It stopped. But the love of God, everything that I saw in heaven was now in me. You know, you see, well, it wasn't just the memory and the beauty and the love that I experienced. And now I was changed. But the love of God, the love of God was now in me. The river that I saw was now in me. And the Holy Spirit was now active in me. And around the bed were like four or five doctors and nurses. And I had the ability to feel or sense what was going in them. And these poor people were terrified. What they just saw, they were scared to death. I tell people they needed to go change their pampers. And <laughs> I felt bad. Here I am. Nothing had changed physiologically with me. I still have all these complications. I was bleeding 10 pints of blood a day sometimes. That's a lot. That's a terrible leak, you know. And, and all these things were bad, but I felt worse for them. I tell people maybe that was the healthiest I ever was. There's no reason I should be in any kind of a mood except horror and and just and and um and um, depression. And I, I felt bad for them because this love I had was just overwhelming, felt bad for them. And, and then that went on for so many years. Like if I hear a doctor hassling a nurse for not doing something right, I would feel bad for both of them. I felt bad for the nurse and more, more of a guy to jump in and want to be kind of a man savior, you know, but I felt bad for the doctor being like this. I'm thinking like, why would he be like that? And I remember, um, you know, racism is a big thing right now. And back then, it was tolerated a lot differently. I mean, people could use the N word and get away with it. And somebody came in, this is, you know, a month or so after this, when I was moved into another hopeless case room, somebody came in and saw a TV guide and the, the group, the Supremes were on the cover. And I said to my visitors, isn't that person pretty? And she goes, well, yeah, for a colored person, I thought, that's really strange. <laughs> you know, all I could see is physical beauty and nice. And all. I didn't, you know, right. and I just thought it was strange to think like that. It's like, that's a person. And all I could see was the goodness about the way they were created. You know, I didn't think like that, but I just, I had this feeling. So the, the love of God is so transforming. I mean, it's like, you don't have to try when you're in the love of God, you're just in another gear. And uh, those things all occurred I know what I was before. And even though I was desperate and all that, I wasn't like this until after this near death encounter or crying out to God. Uh, I, I, that's when I was born again. And that's when the Holy Spirit became active in me in ways that has changed me all these 54 years. Now, I didn't know any of the names of all that stuff. Of course, I learned them all. But I would tell anybody, it doesn't matter how much you know or don't know. What you need is the real thing. And I know I have had the real thing, all the stuff that followed after. Like I said, I was both legs were nerve damaged from below my knees uh, all the way down the front part of my legs. The, the nerves are called the anterior tibialis. And so I had bilateral foot drop. Like uh, if you recall people that in our generation, a lot of people still had polio. And they would see them with a leg brace because they, they lost that. Well, I had a leg brace on this leg. The other one was recovering, but was still very weak. And instantaneously, um, my legs were healed. They don't have any explanation for that. Again, I jumped out of an airplane. Again, I was uh, pretty skinny, 115 pounds, and I jumped from 12,500 feet. And it was great. Everybody thought it was wonderful. Of course, I thought it was wonderful too, but I had far more uh, exciting things to do in the Lord. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't keep skydiving. Uh, and uh, the first five years was being healed and being learning from God the new life that I had received. Mm -hmm. Tell the listeners about how, um, how they operated on your hand. And when they uncovered it, it was entirely black. And then what what did you, what you did about it or what God well, did about it? The first part of the injury, this hand, which was horribly burned, 
it, uh, you've probably seen pictures of burned bodies where they, they're like this. Well, it was all because there's not much flesh there. So the hand was all fused together. It was like this. And they wound up amputating almost all of my fingers that removed one completely, my ring finger in my right hand. And so the hand wasn't useful at all, except to cause pressure and all that. So what they did, and this is about a year and a half after my accident, original accident, they, they excised, they cut off all the scar tissue. So it was just you know, raw flesh and blood vessels sticking out. And they cut a, a pouch like in my abdomen above my rib cage. Like mm -hmm. and they made like a little kangaroo pouch and they put a skin graft underneath that and stuck my hand in there. And so did here. I can show you where you can see it. Well, yeah, see here. There for six weeks, it's called a pedicle graft. So that blood would come from this part of my body. And uh, after six weeks, they cut it out and made it like a little boxing glove. And then, you know, six months later, they did another operation. So I, I tell people when it was like this, I probably have the longest theatrical continuous imitation of Napoleon of anybody in, the, in, in any theater, you know? So I was ready. And so it looked like a little boxing glove. And then they, they uh, were going to cut down in between below the surface here, the uh, metacarpal bones and make little stubby fingers. And then they have to stitch it all around that. So it was all bandaged up. And uh, when uh, that was done, uh, the main doctor went to do a seminar in the in Dominican Republic. And so the number two guy, was going to come after X days and take the bandage off and, and check it and clean it up and put a new dressing on it. And when he did all around here, I can show you right here, all around here where it was all stitched on here, it was all black and necrotic. And he said, oh, no, he said, Mr. Robinson, we've lost this one. Mm -hmm. So you imagine for a doctor, that's bad news to tell a patient. He went through this big operation and it doesn't work, you know. So I don't know how I know how to do this, but uh, of course, he bandaged it back up. He's like, I'm going to come in tomorrow and we'll, we're going to have to cut it off and take care of it. So I don't know how I knew how to do this because I never knew anything about healing or watched anything on TV or read a book. I asked for like six or seven pillows and I put my hand on there and I asked for a floodlight to come in. And I stared and I remember there was kind of a peace that came over me. I don't know how to explain that either because it was pretty disappointing. Um, I looked out through the window over Lake Erie and the sun was going down and I stared at that hand and I commanded blood to go into my hand because by then I knew that skin grafts were successful when you have healthy blood go in there. Now, my scientific background should have been aware that my blood vessels were full of coagulated blood like Elmer's glue. <laughs> and so, but I did it. I don't know how long I did it. I'm far into the night, maybe. And the doctor came in the next day and he set up a sterile field. There's green things around here. And he, he was going to cut it. He put all these instruments on there and he unraveled it. And he said, oh, my God. He was shocked and he went up against the wall. And this hand looked just like it does now. It was completely pink, like a baby's butt took the stitches out and it was never changed anymore. And so I, I can play guitar. I use motorcycles. I go snow and to have that. So God heals today. And I, I didn't have to, I didn't know anything about it, but evidently by the, by the Holy spirit working in me, it worked same with my legs. I didn't, didn't know how to do that. And so I, I have confidence that there's more that can happen than we either were aware of. I mean, the heavenly stuff, you don't have to think about anything. It's above and beyond all processes. <laughs> it's yeah. so amazing. On earth, we need to appropriate the grace and the power that's in us. Because you've done so many of these interviews, you have so many different things that happen to people that never happened before. Am I right? All manner of miracles. And uh, that, that the reason I wanted you to mention your hands, especially was because it seemed like it was a joint effort between you and God to heal yeah. that hand that perhaps if someone hadn't cared enough to be up all night praying and driving the blood flow into the hand like you did, that it might not have happened. But at the same time, someone could do that without God's help and not gain anything. And I wonder why in some cases this would work and others it would not. Well, all I know is what was and what is. And it is, like you said, it is, it is a cooperation. It isn't anything that you can, I mean, yeah, some people, I think, because of the principles of God, there are certain things that work, even if you're not a believer. If a person has faith as a salesman and have a gift of communication and believe what they're doing, they can do things that exceed certain, certain boundaries. Mm -hmm. But these supernatural things, I, I don't think they can be done, okay? It's like, I mean, blind people that see, that's all I know people that are associated with God that that's happened to, 
when you're blind and you can see people have been raised from the dead in this lifetime. I know of people. I mean, I prayed for four people in vegetative comas in the hospital. Two of them woke up when I was there and two of them woke up after I was gone and with no brain damage. And that's remarkable to me, you know, and I, again, all I did was do what the Bible says and it happened. I would like it to work all the time. I've lost too many people these last couple of years worrying over them in cancer as my wife was going through a process of stage four ovarian cancer and she got healed. We had people, we don't never know how many people praying, lots of them. We ourselves were given COVID was going on and mattered to a lot of people, but we we're far more focused on that. But it was a process. And, and we focused on that and she's completely cancer free, but it, we are praying for other people and they didn't get healed. I can't explain that. I'm talking about people you think if anybody deserved it, it'd be them. So I can't explain those that do and those that don't. It's not about how good you are. I don't know, but it is a cooperation with God. And there's obviously more on the end of the supernatural coming from God and what God has established. I do believe there's more that we're going to discover now. It's like even the message of the gospel, I think it's gotten so too much theology. It's simple. Anybody that calls upon the Lord, they shall be saved. It isn't, you know, you got to do this and the other thing. And I believe that the basics that, are, that were given in the scriptures apply today. And I want to, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a scripture. It's in Jeremiah 6. Return to the ancient paths where the good way is. And I'm, I'm, there are certain things that are covenant things that are established. And I think it's real discipleship. That's a term. Real following the Lord is authentic. It's not following it. In other words, we don't become a more of a spiritual giant. And I tell people that I want to be involved with the master of all spirits. And that's the Lord himself. I mean, I've had a lot of experiences. I've met a lot of people, but some people think, you know, like certain belief systems, esoteric belief systems believe you grow more and more and then you become like God. And that's, um, that is the wrong path. We become um, conformed to the image of the Lord, but we are, he is so far above all things. He's, his ways are not our ways, but we experience more of his ways as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? It does. And yet, like your friend who saved you from that burning plane, sometimes we do wonderful things for other people. I don't know if that's inspired by God or just inspired by our own human love for one another. In fact, when he fought to get you out of that plane and your, your parachute was caught on something, I think you said that he dislocated his thumbs. He pulled so hard to yeah, get you did. out. It was one of these superhuman things like somebody could pull up a card or something. And he, mm. he became he visited me in the hospital. This is unlike a skydiver of his type. He was one of the original skydivers. He mm. came to the hospital every day and there was a connection we had. And he, I remember when I first saw my head, I said, it looks like a piece of blank. And he goes, don't ever say that. He would catch me if I got negative. But this is before I got caught up in the Lord, but uh, it still it happened. He wouldn't let me say anything negative. He only believed that I was going to live and get better. And this is unlike him. And these guys, they're all about skydiving. They're tough. They're tough guys. They make the bikers look mild, you know, some of them. But I mean, there was something of a love relationship that happened. And with several of the other ones, um, uh, other people in my life, you know, 19 years old, people were worried about Vietnam, going to Vietnam in college. You lose everything. But you realize how important life is. It's really funny. I want to mention this, Lee. All my life, I had kind of a, an aversion to any kind of confinement. I mean, I said, I don't like trains and I don't like fences. And so, you know, and so I used to, and so then when you're skydiving, well, you're really, you're really free. You're up there. You're, you know, you're free fall. It's, it's a good de description of, of my kind of medication, you know, falling into freedom, you know, a certain period of time, but it was worth it. Now I'm confined. I was in this hospital first one for 167 days and then another one for another six months. And then for years, and I had to learn that you need to have contentment, whatever situation you're in. For some reason, I was able to have joy, especially when I quit being sick. And, you know, when I woke up out of this coma and woke up all that, you also, you wake up to more pain, you feel it more. It was terrible, but going through th to get healed, you had to go through certain things. And that's true in life and some emotional things. When you're in the valley of the shadow of death, he brings us through that valley, but you come out, you can come out a stronger person. And a lot of people think they attribute that to me. They feel like, wow, you're so strong and all that. Well, it's because I was that weak and God brought me through it. When you were in the rehab hospital, you had roommates and you heard a loud crash one night and you were able to help the man this happened to. Tell, yeah, tell us about back. that event. I got to go three weeks before that. It's funny because I was thinking about this when I was walking my dog. I wasn't thinking about it on purpose, but I was going to get married. This wonderful 
young gal that high school sweetheart, she was older than me in university at this time. And all these months had gone by. Maybe it was seven or eight months afterwards. And I'm in the rehab hospital. And over the a pay phone, she told me that we didn't have a life anymore. And that was devastating. So I hung the phone up and I rolled my wheelchair down the dark end of the hall. And I just was trying to deal with it. And I went back to my room and lights were out. I went to bed. And about three o'clock in the morning, my face just plunged into a pillow. I began sobbing. I was brokenhearted. And across the room in his blackness, this man named Larry, who had broken his neck, Larry Jones, he was on a, a, a striker frame. He had screws in his neck. And he said, ma'am, you hear this voice came across the room and said, man, they're going to fix you up. You're going to be back on the street doing your thing. Again. And it was just like, it was the same feeling of being in his voice. It was like waves of love came in. And when those words hit me, my sobs just receded and I stopped crying. And I realized that that part of my life was over. It was painful as it was. Well, three weeks later, but at the same time, middle of the night, this blackened room, I heard this clang. So he had these holes drilled in his heads and spikes putting traction on his neck because he did a bone graft. He, he broke his C4 vertebrae and cut, severed his spine. So he was a quadriplegic. Well, that thing hit the floor. Those spikes pulled out. His head was on a little pad. If he'd had a spasm, his head would have fallen off and he'd have been dead. So somehow I crawled across the floor, pulled myself up and turned on the light with a string. And I'm holding one side of my hand, this, this hand that worked. And this one, blood coming out of his head. I'm screaming for a nurse. I had his life in my hands. And I realized that life is really important. And he did something to impact my life. And then I got to come in and impact his, I literally save his life for a moment. And I'll never forget that the value of life. And this is, so this was a black. So here I am, here I am, this former stockbroker kid, skydiver and next to me is a pre-law guy who broke his neck over here is Larry Jones who broke his neck across from me is an app, white Appalachian guy. Somebody broken his out. He got shot and bruised his spine. Here's pit eyes from here down in the street. We have zero in common, but in there, we loved the hell out of each other. If I can say yeah. that we didn't have, we told jokes about our plight. And, and when I left and walked out of there, it was hard for me to say goodbye because I was leaving and I don't know what was going to, so I stayed in contact with some of them, but that story, I'm glad you brought that up about Larry Jones. Here's a guy. He didn't have anything for himself, but his words were words of life to me. And then three weeks later, I got to reciprocate that to some dimension. That's pretty amazing. To me, and it, and it altered. And so, yeah, at that point, nobody would be a racist, either him or me. And in there, I mean, here's this guy. He's right next to this white Appalachian guy. <laughs> and we loved each other. I mean, so these barriers come down with the love of God. Yeah. You referred a little to this, but I'd like to go back to it for a minute. You said when you first came back, you were still so full of God's love. You couldn't judge anybody. You just loved them. It was inconceivable. It's like, you know, it says that we are, Peter writes that we're partakers of his divine nature. That's probably one of the most powerful explanations of that. You could, you could see people with, through the love of God. That doesn't mean what they're doing wrong is okay. It's just, it's not your part to do that. This kind of love. And, and it's so uh, freeing to be in that. Now, as a leader and as a father and as a man, you have to make discernment or judgments on things and you have to, but to be able to, um, to be able to not sit in the seat of Moses and ju be judgmental and is a, is, is part of our inheritance of what we get. Mm -hmm. But, but that, that experience it. I mean, it, after that, that heaven thing, I mean, I, I never got mad for years. I have since unfortunately been able to accomplish that trait <laughs> of anger. I mean, and, and I was appreciative of so many things. I still had so much loss, but I was unaware of it. I became unaware of what I lost because I had gained a whole new life. Scripture says, my wife just read it to you. If a person finds their life, they'll lose it. If they lose their life in me, they'll find it. And it sounds like a metaphor or a mystical thing, but it's really true. When we live for the Lord, we lose our self-control, our self-sufficiency, our trying to compare ourselves with other people. If we, if we build our life and climb a mountain and we think we're great in this life, I'm the greatest, you know, whatever, you can't, you can't have the freedom that's in God. But when you find out your identity is in, your identity is in identifying who he is and how he identifies you, you don't have to try.
and you've gained the real kind of life that we're supposed to have. One of the drawbacks to organized religion is the fact that they are so judgmental, not only of other standards and beliefs of other religions, but also members of their own congregation. It's really often more rule driven than love driven. What's your experience with that? Well, I think because I, you know, I've been a pastor at several different times and places and been a leader and other things. Rule, I think when things are hardcore rules or theological, their attempt is either keep people right or scare people to be right. And it, you can scare goats into a sheep pen and they're still goats. You know, <laughs> you know, you know and that's it's a little agricultural comparison. But when people are compelled by love to change and they experience the love of God, well, here's a good example. The first chapter of the Gospel of John, Philip finds this guy named Nathaniel and says, hey, we have found him, the Messiah, the one the prophets talk about. He said, who? He said, Jesus of Nazareth, he is. So he, he reveals his zero faith. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He says to him, come and see. So then he, somehow the next, he's approaching Jesus and uh, the next day. And uh, Jesus says, oh, an Israelite in whom there's no guile. Some translation says no deceit. He comments on understanding or discerning his character. He's like, how do you think you know me? And he goes, the other day before Philip called you, I saw you under that fig tree. So he, he somehow, Jesus had a vision or perception of what happened at that moment. And he goes from zero, zero faith to believing because of, he says, because I gave you this little incy teensy wincy little bit of revelation, he says, you'll see the heavens open in the sun. In other words, you'll get more revelation. And so, but Philip says, come and see. If there's anything I want to do to every person is make them, invite them to have their own personal encounter with the Lord themselves, not vicariously through a rule system or even through another person. I may be, like I say, if I, when I share with people, whether it's one person or a group of people, it's like I can build a bridge for them to walk on and meet the Lord. Yeah. I mean, for it to be the way it's supposed to be, it needs to be like it was for those two, for Philip and for Nathaniel, and then to include Jesus in that. Jesus saw that and connected with that to the point where it drew him in from out of his unbelief, but it was personal. Now, this was a, an Israelite. I'm sure there was rules. There was the law. There was all that stuff, which were barriers to most people and are to this day. They're barriers to most people. If we can do it through the law, we have no need for God himself. You know? and, well, and Jesus often pointed out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who would set down these rules for other people and then not, not follow you. them themselves. The only uh, people who seem to have a hard time with were the Pharisees. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because they were law based rather than love based. Mickey, we're just about out of time, and I want to leave time for you to talk a little about your two books. Falling into Heaven was the one I was familiar with, but there's another one as well. So tell our audience Listen, about the Yeah, They can look at my books. website or look on whatever Amazon, but this is Falling into Heaven. Uh -huh. And it is a, a skydiver's gripping account of heaven, healings, and miracles. And of course, it got some endorsements from Don Piper, a man who wrote 90 Minutes in Heaven. He did the foreword, and there's several people like Michael W. Smith, who were actually, actually close friends. And and uh, weren't back then, but are now. And then this one's called Supernatural Courage, uh, Activating Spiritual Bravery to Win Today's Battles, actually done a forward by Michael W. and Debbie Smith and several other people in here. People that actually know me and they still say nice things about me. And that is a supernatural miracle. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, in these last couple of years, we do need a courage that we've never had before. Yeah. It was uh, on September 14th after 9-11 that Billy Graham is saying we're fighting a different kind of battle, a different kind of enemy. And we need all that the Holy Spirit can show us to win this. And that 9-11 still really bothers me to this day, the suffering of those people and the trauma that it, that occurred and the condition of our, of our, I mean, kids in high school now, for 9-11, it would be like when I, when we were in high school, like Pearl Harbor, you know, it was, well, you know, that was a long time ago, but, but it was real. When I remember the magazine, Life magazine covers, and I actually went to Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, it was very emotional for me. But we lived in this where our world was changed with fear, intimidation. Uh, we had terrorism, became rampant in various areas. But we need uh, to walk with the Lord. It's a different kind of courage, more than it is to jump out of an airplane or to put on a uniform or do anything. It's, it's unnatural, the kind of courage it is that the Lord calls us to. And me and people in the Bible do crazy things, but he was right and it always worked. And so there's 11 chapters in there. It applies to everybody. And I just commit it because we, I want to be 
life and encouragement to all people that can embrace that. And I would join with you in encouraging people to look for their own personal encounter with God, because as good as religion can be sometimes, there's no comparing it to having a, a personal mystical experience. You don't have to come near to death in order to have one. There are all sorts of things that you can gain through prayer and meditation and the like. So it's asking and receiving, knocking will be open. And it just, it's very simple. Call out to God. If you want to do it with another person, find somebody who is really persuaded. It's mm -hmm. the love of God. It's Jesus first, all the scriptures and all that. And just have any kind of, but just call out to God yourself. If it helps to go for a walk in the woods, if it helps to go up in your room and just get quiet for a while, either way, God is so faithful and good. And I just want to pray for your, these listeners right now, if I can, if you don't mind. First of all, I want to say to you, Lee, I so enjoyed you telling me your story about your seven-year-old experience. And then when you were 20s, I was relating that to my wife, Barbara, this morning in our quiet time. And so meaningful to me. I'm going to remember that. It's powerful. Oh, thank you. So if you're listening to this, and uh, one way or the other, you will be, the things that I told you are true. And they're only true because it's about my weakness and God's incredible strength. Jesus is alive, and so am I today, 54 years later, when I should have been dead, or I should have been in a nursing home, I should have been blind, I should have been paralyzed, but I'm alive, and I've had this gift of life, and I want to share with you, and I agree with Lee, you don't have to go through, a, through an airplane crash, you don't have to be, a, you don't have to have an addiction, you just need to know you need God, and if you know him, you need him more today than maybe you have before, so Lord, I pray for everybody right now. To have to take a deep breath and say sincerely, Lord, I really want to know you. Jesus, I ask you to release me from all my guilt and shame associated with my mistakes and forgive me of all my wrongdoings and wash me. And you look that they'll experience the cleansing I experienced in the heavenly realm and as I walk on earth. And Lord, I, I ask that you'd help them. I ask you, the listeners right now, to forget about any church failures, any religious failures, and think of the success of our Lord, that he loved you and I so much, he sent Jesus to the earth to die on the cross, and he was raised from the dead, and he extends that life through this message. Just call out to God, and you will find the miracle love of God will transform your life. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray and believe, and I bless Lee and all the programs he's doing now and has done before. I bless him and his, all of his ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Lee. It's been a treat to have you on the show. They can look up MickeyRobinson.com. There's lots of stuff on there they can see for free. And if you want to look stuff up, there's email stuff and whatever. But I just want to know, I just commend this show and have other people watch. Just have other, just invite people to watch. It's like Philip invited Nathaniel, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Taste and see that he's good. <laughs> and you'll find out it's better than ice cream. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, if listeners would like to hear the show again or any of our more than 470 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.